Uh, hi, I'm uh, Brian Cantrell. I am the, the CTO of Joyent. Uh, Joyent um, was a startup. We were uh, uh, recently acquired by Samsung. So I actually now work for Samsung. Samsung may be a company that you care a lot more about today than you did yesterday, because Samsung uh, and the, the division that, that bought us inside of Samsung is actually the mobile division. And you might be surprised to learn that they actually make mobile devices, phones, phones that, that have beautiful cameras, phones that are water resistant, and they've got a very new technology. They actually have a headphone jack. Um, <laughs> So I, I was actually kind of overwhelmed with like the DMs yesterday, being like, all right, so which Samsung do I get? I'm like, what's going on? Like, how, I mean, this is the Apple one? How can you screw up a launch this? Oh, never mind, OK. Anyway, so um, I now work for, uh, for Samsung, which is actually very exciting. Samsung is going to be using our technology to do a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, and I'm presenting on, on containers reflecting after the first decade, which is not totally accurate. I actually doctored this title a little bit to make it a little less frightening, because the actual answer is, if we clicker. No? Do I have the wrong clicker? Ah. There we go. The actual answer is it's after the third decade. I said the first decade, so I seemed like old enough to be interesting without so old to be actually terrifying. Um, but I'm actually old enough to be terrifying. I mean, you can just ask my kids. Um, and we are actually three decades in to three decades plus in the containers. So when were containers born? What is the date of birth of containers? Well, we actually have this. We actually know the date of birth. Containers going through the birth canal, March 18th, 1982. Do not raise your hand if you were not alive. I don't want to know. Um, <laughs> suffice it to say, a bunch of us were alive, OK? Um, but uh, March, March 18th, 1982, uh, and they were born with this new idea in 7th edition Unix um, called a Chirut. And Chirut, the idea of Chirut, is changing the root directory. So it's the root directory. You, you are in a subdirectory, you're specified a subdirectory, and now this directory becomes the new root directory. You are in a virtual universe, a virtual file system, where you can now install software thinking that it is in the root file system when it is, in fact, in a subdirectory. It's a very good idea. And we don't know why we have it, which is kind of funny. Um, no one actually knows why. Bill, this was integrated by Bill Joy. Bill Joy, a bit of a space ranger, kind of in a, constantly in a near-Earth orbit. Um, Bill Joy integrated this March 18, 1982. Probably some THC in the system, I'm guessing, some memory loss issues. Um, you know, it's, it's the 80s. It's Berkeley. Um, you'd have a contact high from doing this work. But we actually don't know why he did it. We think he did it um, to develop uh, 4.2BSD. Uh, he was developing 4.2BSD on a previous version. But um, this is as close as we're going to get um, and to why we actually have Truth. But it's, it's an incredibly powerful thing. Whatever we have it, it's an incredibly powerful idea. And it was the birth of a very important idea. And it was an idea that, that people saw and they wanted to do other things things with. One of the other things they wanted to do was CD dot dot out of a true environment, which actually able, would enable you to root the box. So there were some early vulnerabilities that were kind of quickly cleaned up. But Chirut seemed like it was, a, it was a good step, but that you could go do a lot more. You could go build a much more comprehensive virtual environment within the operating system. And so let's fast forward to 2000 um, with the introduction of jails from FreeBSD. And this is one of these things where all you need to know is the name. It's a jail, OK? Incarceration is the model. Punishment is the model. We are trying to punish the wayward application, in this case, FTPD. I think if FTPD didn't have so many vulnerabilities, we probably wouldn't have jails. So I guess thank you, FTPD, for your vulnerabilities. Um, and the, the FreeBSD folks invented jails to be able to take effectively untrusted software and run it on the computer as root as root in quotes. It's running as root as UID 0, but it can't actually see the whole box. It can only see what's in its little jail, its little cell. That's all that it can see. And you know, you can see this was done for a bunch of reasons. Um, I think uh, laziness is definitely among them, and I say that as a compliment. I say that as one lazy software engineer to another. I, I respect your laziness, sir. Um, the, the, and the, the kind of the laziness here is, Ah, uh, we really don't want to solve the Unix problem of root can do everything, right? So Unix has this problem that once you become root, you can annihilate the box. Um, you can rm minus rf everything. So let's actually, we don't actually want to solve that problem. So instead of solving that problem, let's create this little virtual environment in, in which UID 0 is not UID 0 on the entire box. And that was a jail. And that was a really good idea. So if Truth was a good idea, now jails is, is a much fuller manifestation of it. But it is a jail. I mean, it's not like it's not exactly a great place for an application to go. I mean, you actually are in jail. And there are all sorts of things that an application couldn't do in jail. It's like, well, you are in jail. So of course you can't do these things. Um, things that, that an application wanted to go do. 
And we, got, we kind of saw this at Sun. I was at Sun for 14 years prior to coming to join. And we saw this at Sun and wanted to take this to, to an extreme. Um, and how can we go not have a jail, but how can we have a full application environment? And we developed something called Zones. So um, Zones developed in Sun, at Sun, it, hopefully the 2002 era, a great paper on this. And by the way, there are two very good papers written on jails and Zones. I actually did a Papers We Love on this. Um, and you can see how long I'll talk when not given a countdown timer. The answer is about, about one minute and 43, uh, one hour and 43 minutes. Um, so if you're going to play the quintillion drinking game while watching that talk on YouTube, you might end up in the hospital. You might end up EMT'd. Um, so that, it's, a, it's a long presentation, but it's, it, we go into these two papers that are actually incredibly interesting. These are, they, these are two very interesting ideas. And the idea with zones in Solaris, the idea with zones is we're going to run an application, give it a full application environment. We give it a full user space, give it a full, a full file system space, and so on, give it a full process space. But it can only see what's in that zone. Now, very importantly, you're in a virtual operating system, but you're running on the single one operating system kernel. So every application that is running in a zone is running on the hardware. You're actually, you, you are getting the full performance advantage of, of being on the hardware, full tenancy advantage, and so on. So we thought this was a great idea, um, and the, the, we, we thought we developed this fully. Uh, as it turns out, um, you know, sometimes the, you, ideas, great ideas don't get traction right away. This was definitely one of them. Um, some folks saw this as a great idea. Inside of Sun, this was kind of withering on the vine. Fortunately, we open sourced the operating system, which is its own odyssey. Um, we we uh, open sourced the operating system, and others outside of Sun saw the power of zones when Sun itself did not. And actually, one of those companies was Joyent. So courtesy of the Wayback Machine, here we have the Joyent page circa 2006. It's kind of painful for me to read. This thing, like a, like a garbage heap from, from the Paleolithic era, this thing is just loaded with information for future anthropologists. It's like hundreds of Web 2.0 applications. It's like, Daddy, what was Web 2.0? What was Web 1.0? It's like, nobody knows. They're all marketing terms. But I, the, we, I'm, I'm, we're lucky we didn't get Ajax on this one. Um, web, I mean, Ajax, what a dumbass. So Ajax, for those of you millennials, let me just educate you for a second. Ajax, all in caps, stands for asynchronous JavaScript and XML. But that doesn't make any sense. Of course that doesn't make any sense. Um, it's like, and isn't XML itself an acronym? Yes, it was a very bad idea, but it was all about Ajax was the rage back in the day, back in the web 2.0 day, which also made no sense, moving right along. Uh, so we had accelerators. Uh, did you know that uh, Joint has the largest open Solaris installation in the world? Like, whoa, two computers running open Solaris. Um, <laughs> the, did you know that Joint manages 107 terabytes of data? All right, now, I'm glad 107 terabytes at least is more than you have on your phone currently, but not for long. Um, and I, I love this quote from this company, Obvious, that you haven't heard of, that Joint Accelerators less scale, da 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 You haven't heard of them because they renamed themselves to Twitter. Uh, Twitter was a, was a, a huge Joint customer. Um, Twitter was growing exponentially, and then they were fi they, the CEO at the time likes to brag that he fired them as a customer because he was sick of dealing with them. That CEO was subsequently fired. Uh, we'll definitely over drinks. We can compare bad CEO stories. Um, but so, so Obvious was a customer. And, and, the, and these things were great. They allowed terrific tenancy, uh, terrific performance, per, per, terrific scale. But something else also happened in 2006. So the, and EC2 happened in 2006. At the same time, uh, I mean, almost concurrently, Amazon announced the limited beta for EC2, for the, the elastic the Elastic Compute Cloud, of course, very important. And so Joint was using containers. What was EC2 using? Were they using containers? Oh, no, no. Au contraire. No, no. And this is now we need to do a sad little aside, a sad tale of woe called hardware level virtualization. Because the containers are not the only way to virtualize a workload. The way they were done at, at Sun and at Joint, entirely multi tenant safe and so on. But there is another way to virtualize a workload. You can actually virtualize not the operating system, but the hardware. And what you present to a tenant is not a virtual OS and a virtual system, virtual system call table. You present a virtual x86 microprocessor, virtual DRAM, virtual NIC, virtual and I got this, I got a prop for this, a virtual one of these, which you may, again, if you're millennials, you probably recognize this, but your day is coming when, that when your coworkers will not recognize one of these. This is a floppy disk. It's like, is it floppy? No, it's not floppy. That's a long story. But <laughs> it, this is a three and a half inch disk. Um, and you'd be like, wow, what a relic. And it is a relic, but it's also virtualized in every, in every virtual machine that you run today. You have a virtual floppy disk. 
It's like, but that makes no sense. You're right, it doesn't make any sense. Like, why would you have that? Well, it's just kind of dead code until it's exploitable, and that's called Venom. So Venom actually exploited the virtual floppy disk controller in a virtual machine. So this is serious stuff. And it's like, it doesn't feel like having a, a virtual computer is going to make things any faster, and it definitely doesn't, because every tenant now has to have their own OS kernel, because it's seeing hardware, right? You need an OS kernel to run on hardware. And trust me, I write a kernel. Kernels don't get along with one another. I mean, people who write kernels are control freaks, and operating system kernels do not get along well with one another. These are very fat applications that want to control all of the resources they have. And as a result, and this is where you get to the, the, the real, uh, the, the danger of the abstraction, uh, uh, is that because it will consume every resource that you give it, it's incredibly resource inefficient from the perspective of the hypervisor that needs to run this stuff. And in particular, in terms of DRAM. When you give an operating system DRAM, it takes it. The end. You are giving heroin to an addict. That's it. <laughs> Up the arm. It's like, hey, do you still have that heroin I gave you two years ago? It's like, no. What are you... <laughs> Come on, dude, I'm on the fentanyl now. I mean, I, they, the, so you can, when you give DRAM to, to one of these guests, it's gone from the hypervisor's perspective, even though, P.S., the DRAM isn't likely being used. When you spin up a VM on EC2 on Amazon, how much of that DRAM do you use? And if you're like, I use every last bit of DRAM, there's an ops person somewhere that wants to do violence to your body because it's dangerous to actually exploit every last bit of DRAM, right? You're running very close to the wind. You're not using every bit of DRAM. In fact, you're probably adjusting your estimates such that you're only using half, right? Or maybe you're using three quarters. The problem is that you're handing that estimate on to someone else who just us in, doesn't trust you and thinks you're a little bit of a jackass. Nice, nice person, but you know, a little uh, often gets these estimates wrong. I'm gonna multiply this again to get, I, I'm gonna actually assume that they're off by another factor, and these factors get multiplied together until you have a VM that's got a ton of memory doing absolutely nothing. Um, unless it's running Java, in which case it's actually garbage collecting all the time, but that, that's a, a different story. <laughs> It, it does not play well with others. It's terrible with respect to tenancy. And yet, thanks EC2, it's de facto in the cloud. So that's just, this is just what happened. Um, all right, so what was going on in kind of container land? Well, in container land, which was a very lonely island, popu population one, population largest open Solaris installation in the world, um, in containers since circa 2011, we actually, um, even though we strongly believed in containers, um, we actually realized we needed to do hardware level virtualization as well. Um, because we, I, we've got, we couldn't run Linux binaries, so okay, let's do hardware level virtualization so we can run Windows and Linux and so on. And boy, do we, it, it, you thought I was a vegetarian before getting a tour of the sausage factory. You, I mean, going into the sausage factory of hardware level virtualization and seeing just how bad and archaic it is, and you can't do anything about it. It's the abstractions themselves that are actually confining. It's the fact that you're booting on an abstraction that dates from Boca Raton in 1979, where the IBM personal computer was first developed. I mean, it's unconscionable. Um, you shouldn't have to know what real mode is. Real mode is a war crime. Um, and yet, that e every VM boots in real mode. So we realized that we, we had to go, and actually I had to debug an issue in real mode in 2011 as we ported KVM to SmartOS. I'm like, what? You ha and you just have to go into like your safe antiquarian antiques roadshow kind of space. Like, I'm antiquing. Like, I'm not actually living this right now. I am, I am enjoying, I'm like, I'm, this is like steampunk. I am, I, you know, I, I, because if you're like, if you're trying to treat it as actually modern infrastructure, you actually go insane. Why are we doing it this way? It's like, no, 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 we're, we're antiquing, we're antiquing. It's like, okay, okay, we're antiquing. Okay. Um, it's like, but, but, but you're trying to treat the table as load bearing. Um, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, so it, we came out of that with actually even stronger resolve. It's like, okay, God, if I, if I didn't believe in the container, I believe in containers going into this, very, very, very firmly believe in containers fervently believed in OS based virtualization. This is obviously the only answer. And indeed, wow, this actually, OS virtualization actually opens up some really interesting possibilities. So circa 2012, 2013, again, the rest of the world had not discovered the, 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 the long lost island known as containers. So we were kind of off on our lonesome at Joint. And we, were, we had this great abstraction in terms of containers. And we, we realized that actually, this could revolutionize the way we do storage. Because we wanted to go build a storage service, a la S3. But we didn't want to just build an S3, and we realized that with the power of containers, we could build a storage service like S3, HTTP puts and gets and so on, that when you wanted to compute upon it, you could spin up a container where your object actually lives. So you could actually perform arbitrary computation on your object without moving it. 
And this is one, if this is something that seems obvious to you now, I can assure you it was not obvious to us at the time. It seems obvious in retrospect, but it's one of these ideas that is just like, oh my God, was that in front of us all along? That is an incredibly powerful idea. And it is a powerful idea. So over uh, 2012 and early 2013, we built this thing called Manta, uh, which we later open sourced, all available. It's ZFS based, container based, internet facing object source, so like S3, but offers that power of in situ compute, which allows you to do all sorts of things without actually moving data. And the, remember, the abstraction that you're getting with a container is the operating system. And by the way, this operating system, Unix, god damn it, Unix is actually, I mean, let, let's, let's forget our kind of petty differences of the Unix wars. We all are, we are all believers in Unix. I mean, even Redmond is a believer in Unix now. It's actually amazing. Um, Unix is actually built around the idea of ad hoc data processing. So Unix is actually perfect for this. And this, this brings in, again, if you're playing the Contrillion drinking game, you want to be sure to take a drink now, because we are going to do a first reading, a reading from the book of Doug McIlroy, um, McIlroy 315, um, the Unix philosophy. So when, when Unix, and I, Unix is still to me, uh, the, the more I know, the more I appreciate the revolution that is Unix in 1970. The more you, in the early, late 60s, early 70s, the systems that came before Unix seem unbelievably antiquarian, truly antiquarian. And Unix actually feels modern because it was, instead of having these massive monoliths, it was these collections of programs that were designed to, to each program itself was designed a, a, to do one thing well, and you could actually string them together with this great idea called pipes. And pipes were an idea by Doug McIlroy. Doug McIlroy is kind of the Unix founder that you haven't heard of. People have heard of, of, of Ken Thompson, Dennis Ritchie, but it's really Doug McIlroy that gives us the pipe, gives us the idea of Unix and the Unix philosophy. That, that is say write programs that do one thing and do it well, write programs to work together, write programs to handle text streams, because that is a universal interface. If you do systems work, you should have daily affirmation with the Unix philosophy. You should read this aloud as you're like greeting the sun in the morning as a systems programmer. You should be reading the Unix philosophy. Um, and because this is incredibly powerful still. Four decades later, I think this is as, as relevant as ever, and we see shadows of it everywhere. So as another kind of aside, because a, a really kind of concrete example of this is one of the, the, the greatest battles in the history of computer science. Doug McIlroy in one corner, the inventor of pipes in Unix. Don Knuth, the inventor of a, of a bunch of books that are sitting on your bookshelf to look smart, but you haven't actually read. <laughs> These two actually battling off with John Bentley, author of Programmer, Programming Pearls, a book short enough that you actually might have read it, um, that had this challenge, read a file of text, determine the end most frequently used words, and print out a sorted list of those words along with their frequencies. Now, reading this now, you're just like, that's a challenge? That seems like that's like not even an intern project. That's like, that's, wait, what are you talking about? Um, this is like, this is uh, an, an easy test for someone coming into ops or what have you. But this was a challenge in 1986. Don Knuth's solution over here. Don Knuth, a purpose built algorithm in web. Yes, that's all caps for a reason. A system that you, as they say, haven't heard of for a reason. A, a Pascal like literate programming system. And this is a, he invented a totally bespoke algorithm. And then, as if Harrison Ford in, in, the, in Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, if you're a millennial gazing over, right, glazing over right now, see Indiana Jones. I know you're not seeing it because you're just trying to defy the Gen Xers and the baby boomers that you work with, but do us a favor and see the goddamn movie. The Harrison Ford, it, the, as Indiana Jones, um, Doug McIlroy pulls out his revolver and shoots Don Knuth <laughs> with this unbelievably short Unix pipeline that does exactly this. And if you're, if you're a Unix nerd like many of us are, you may be like, wow, like that was, he it really kind of put a finishing move on him with that said dollar one Q. <laughs> and like a little kind of a little flourish, a little moral combat kind of flourish. Um, because like he, you should just use head for that. And you, you would use head if it had been invented. Amazingly, this predates head. You're like, all right, it's one of those things like, all right, tail was obvious, but head was totally subtle. Okay, anyway. Um, uh, so, and so Doug McIlroy slays Don Knuth and a total triumph of the Unix philosophy. And we can actually do this now in Manta. So this is an actual Manta job that is finding things in my public directory, the, seven man, the seventh edition man page. This is going to give a shout out. Um, and creating a Manta job. That's what that M job create does. And it's saying, I want the map phase. I want to do exactly what Doug McIlroy did. So that's the Doug McIlroy pipeline right there. In the reduce phase, it uses awk. God bless awk. Talk about another. 
I, if you have not read the awk programming language, another daily affirmation for you. God bless awk. Um, I, I'm definitely a, a, an awk evangelist, an awk revivalist. Um, awk is beautiful, very sh quick, simple, and so on. And awk is actually serving as the reduce phase. Um, and this actually gives you the same output, but now it's arbitrarily scalable to an arbitrary amount of data. So th uh, th this, is the, this is the power of Unix. This is the power of containers. This is the power of containers to revolutionize the abstractions that we're thinking about. So say we. We're like, wow, this is amazing. This is amazing. And Manta, like, boy, all right, so we, we believe in zones. Then we do KVM, and we come out being like really strong believers in zones. Then we do Manta, and we are just on a different planet. Like, we exist in a different time and space. We feel a joint, like, an alien race with some sort of advanced technology that Earthlings don't yet have. But the thing is, we actually want the Earthlings to have the technology, goddammit, so why won't they take it? Um, because we were like, wow, this is amazing, but we realized people didn't get Manta. They're like, I don't get it. You're like, what do you don't get? Like, you spin up a container on your data, and they, we actually tried to show them with this. We, we have a, another utility called mlogin. mlogin allows you to log into your object. You're like, what? Yeah, you can, if you mlogin your S3-like object path, boom, you're in a shell, a root shell, on, in a little container, sitting somewhere far, far away, you're in a little container with your object and only your object safely mapped into you. And you can run whenever you want it. But it so you got this little interactive shell. And you're like, ugh, ugh, ugh. Okay. It's a, okay, I'm still like, my brain is blowing up. It's like, okay, it's, it's not that, okay, really? Okay, well, that's great. Well, I mean, let's blow up your brain. It's like, okay, well, like, you guys are great, but this is really weird, man. This party got really, really strange. It's like, no, these drugs are great. It's like, no, I, I need to go home. I'm serious. Like, when's the last bus? I, so we're like, don't go home. Don't go home. Uh, that kind of happened over and over again. And we're like, when is the world going to figure this out? This, the world has to figure this out. This can't go on forever. The world is going to figure out containers. And they did. They did uh, in two minutes into this talk um, by a PaaS provider that, as again, you haven't heard of for a reason, a company called DotCloud. DotCloud is struggling, um, and they have decided to, do, to pull off an amazing Hail Mary that we should all be actually grateful for. An amazing Hail Mary. They are failing as a business. They're not going to make it. We're actually going to we're going to scale all the way back. And the Hail Mary is that we're going to open source our software. That software is Docker. Um, and that is Docker Inc. So uh, if you're ever looking for an argument to open source software, by the way, in an otherwise dying company, that's a pretty good one. Um, so they open source Docker, and now people get it. And the, the match is lit, and the, the fuse is lit, and everyone gets it. Which is gr or people begin to start getting like, wow, this is amazing. Now, you might think, like, wow, you guys must have been like totally mental frustrated by that. But actually, no. Honestly, we were excited and are excited that everyone now gets the same, sees the same thing that we see, does the same drugs that we do. And now, and not necessarily, okay, we do harder drugs, but they, um, <laughs> but sees the power of containers. So why did the revolution start with Docker and not before that. And the reason I, I think, looking back on it, is that we always emphasize, aside from Manta, um, well, even with Manta, we were emphasizing the operational characteristics of containers. These things are rocket fast. You don't have this dumbass thing slowing you down. They, they, they are incredibly fast, you get great tendency, and so on. Which people are like, kind of meh. I mean, people do care about, but the people that care about it are totally disempowered in their organizations. Like, I love you guys, but my manager doesn't care. Um, so there was a lot of that. But what Docker did, actually, Docker connected to people in a much more, and, and this, the kind of container revolution we're now, connects to people in a much more important way because it actually allows us as developers to think operationally in the software that we deploy. We generate these giant now, effectively static binaries called a container, and we can now run in production the same thing that I'm running on my laptop. I don't have this kind of bespoke pet, this kind of zombie pet in production. I'm ideally running the same thing in production that I'm running on my laptop. This allows developers to think operationally, and most importantly, it allows developers to move faster. Software is truly, 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 truly eating the world. Uh, we are all very, very lucky, very lucky to be in this domain at this time. This is a golden age, I promise you, because everyone is figuring out that, that 10 years ago, 15 years ago, uh, software was viewed as a cost. 
Um, IT was something you outsourced, that, the, that you were, and you heard Adrian say this yesterday, and he's absolutely right. People were trying to, that all they were trying to do is reduce costs, reduce costs, reduce costs. And I think you can even argue that our arguments in favor of zones and containers came from the fact that we grew up in that area, era. I grew up in that era. I'm like, look, zones cost you less. Eh, don't care as much anymore, because what I actually care about is writing software quickly so I can go compete and innovate. Because what we now have happening that we did not have happen for a long time or haven't ever had app ever is software companies are disrupting mainstream business. Taxi companies, companies that actually predate the automobile, livery predates the automobile, they've had a chokehold on their markets for generations. They are finally being slain by a software company by actually like five different software companies all competing with one another with all outsized multi-trillion dollar valuations. But it, the, the, the point is, <laughs> and you can argue like, oh, they're over, blah, 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 this, you can do it, yeah, fine. But like the old world is not coming back, is definitely not coming back. And the fact that software companies are disrupting the hotel industry, software companies are now disrupting all of these old industries, it's got everyone's attention. And containers are right at the tip of that spear. They accelerate software development, all, and they dovetail right into microservices. We heard Adrian talk about, a lot about that yesterday. Microservices, containers, these things are all related to one another. They are all about allowing us to go faster. So when we saw this, we were like, Yes, this is great. The world gets it. And so we developed this thing called Triton. So late 2014, early 2015, we see the energy behind Docker. We're extremely excited. But what we want to do is actually combine the strength of zones, industrial grade strength, proven strength of zones, total security of zones, with the, the excitement, the energy, the enthusiasm, and, and most importantly, the accelerated software development you get with Docker. And we developed this thing called Triton. So what we did is we took SmartOS. And you're like, wait a minute, isn't that Solaris? Like, OK, please don't say the S word, first of all. Um, because we've been, and I'm going to try to go through this without making an Axis Powers analogy with my, the, the former owner of the, uh, nah, forget it. Um, the, what we did is we actually took the, the, the Linux system call table and we implemented the Linux system call table on top of SmartOS. So we were able to run Linux binaries natively on the metal in a zone. Um, and then very importantly, we also took the, the Docker, which we all know and love. Docker actually has a remote API, as it turns out. And we, as we were kind of exploring this, we realized we could implement the Docker engine in our cloud or because of, thanks to the remote API, we could actually go implement the, a remote API endpoint that would look and feel and smell like Docker to Docker the command, but would actually be an entire data center filled with containers. So that's what we did with Triton. So when you, when you spin up a container with Triton, you do a Docker PS, you see your containers across the entire data center. It means that things like Docker Compose, which are really interesting from a developer's simplicity perspective, but of limited efficacy because they don't work in the cloud, actually work on us because a, 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 a Docker machine, machine is actually a data center. So we were very excited about this. Um, and again, we made this very important decision to actually re-implement the, the API, and this was not lost on people. Uh, and in particular, uh, Kelsey um, saw the, the talk that I gave when we announced this in January of 2015. He said, hey, I really enjoyed the talk. Out of curiosity, why replace the Docker daemon entirely and not implement a new execution driver for branded zones? Very good question question that shows a sharp level of attention, because we had the exact same question. And what we realized is that when we went into the Docker daemon, it was simply too specific, too immature, moving too quickly. It was not reasonable to recast this in terms of, of our stack. But what we could do is go implement that API. So um, to which I responded, hey, listen, uh, we, I said tunning, I meant running. Running the Docker daemon in the global zone um, is way too much risk. It was much easier to do this. And of course, it was all open source at that point. Um, Kelsey's like, OK, great, that makes sense. Uh, I love, congrats on nailing the implementation of the demo. This shows you that Kelsey actually demos things in front of an audience. Um, this morning, when Kelsey was kind of pausing on console to see everything, you're like, oh, come on, baby, come on, come on. And Kelsey's like, it's there! It's there! And you're like, why is he celebrating so much? Like, shouldn't this always work? It's like, yes, of course it always works. But boom, it worked. Um, <laughs> And, the, and you only understand this if you've done this under fire. So, um, but, so Kelsey totally understands it. Hey, congrats on the, the, the demo gods were working. They were working that day, thank God. Um, and then I say, hey, hey, thanks. And I imagine others will also take this route. I also, I just kind of went back and reread this tweet recently. I'm like, damn, that was prescient. I, you know, I'm, not always, I'm kind of a Gatling gun of random thoughts, but that one was actually pretty prescient. Um, robust APIs are essential for the container ecosystems. This is something I believe in fervently. I know Kelsey believes, and a lot of us in the room believe in this. We need robust APIs. And we're going to talk about that as we kind of look forward here in just a second. 
But this was to a certain degree ominous foreshadowing because the world was simpler then um, in early 2015. Um, and the, the, the <laughs> Wow, okay, you're not supposed to have like a sad, knowing chuckle. I mean, you chuckled as if I said in 1942 that the world was simpler in 1938. Um, you're, that, that's really not supposed to be that kind of a chuckle. Um, but it's true, the world was simpler. Uh, we, we just, th th there was uh, less, there was less attention to it because people were just kind of figuring this out. And there's been, of course, this explosion as everyone has realized, wow, this is the next thing. And everyone is moving and trying to move, everyone's trying to move faster than, than the next person, next company, and this has created a lot of technology. Um, and the technology is very complicated. And I don't know if you know Camille Fournier, Camille is great, great, great technologist, CTO out of New York, Camille, uh, CMU, CS, worked at Goldman Sachs, CMU, the, or Camille is nails as far as the technologist goes. Camille is so good as a technologist that she has the confidence to look at this stuff and be like, holy crap, this is complicated, wow. And Camille, Camille is a zookeeper committer, okay? <laughs> Seriously put that in perspective. Like Camille has got a high threshold for pain. I mean, this is a life, I, th this is someone who, my father was an emergency medical physician. This is somebody who's got a blood alcohol level of like 25 times the legal limit being like, okay, now I'm drunk. It's like, this is like, wow, wow, wow. And also, not just wow complicated, but also crazy complicated. Uh, how many characters can I fit in here to say how complicated it is? So, wow, this is complicated. And the question that I was asking last year at KubeCon is, are we near peak confusion in the container space? <laughs> and, the, and I was kind of asking everyone this, because like, I was confused. It's like, there's so much going on. I'm confused. Like, just tell me the confusion is going to get better. And people were saying, no, it's still accelerating in 2015. I don't know if it's still accelerating or not. I kind of feel like we're maybe in that weightlessness going over the top of confusion. I don't know. I, I, I don't know if it's still accelerating. I know there is a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of confusion. Um, and this is a problem. As we go forward, looking forward from 2015 into 2016 and beyond now, there is a problem. And there are, we have got challenges in front of us. And yes, we'll, we're going to collectively figure them out. But sometimes people say that because they're not going to be the ones figuring it out. We're going to be the ones figuring it out. We're going to be doing the hard work of actually figuring this stuff out. And we've got a lot of stuff to figure out. So in particular, there is, there is a battle. The battle lines are being drawn between two ways of thinking. The, what I call the framework approach versus the library approach. The framework approach is I, the framework, am in control, and I will call out to you in certain contexts. And these contexts are kind of strange and ill-specified, but that is where you will add your functionality. The library approach says I will provide some libraries as a toolbox that you will pull off the shelf and use to build new things. Now, obviously, I'm a bit, I've got a bit of a library bias here. And yes, I was a J2EE naysayer back in the day. feel a little bit vindicated by that one. Um, but it, <laughs> This is the danger of frameworks, is that frameworks, they ease your initial adoption, but then they ultimately sacrifice flexibility because they've made so many decisions for you, and they might not be decisions that you agree with. Or they may be decisions that you agree with, but the next organization over in your company that needs to implement this, the hell if they agree with it. Right? This is, I think people don't understand that when your software crosses organizational boundaries within a company, you've set yourself up for failure. Because the organizations are obviously not going to agree with one another. I mean, clearly they're at war with one another. Um, so this is a challenge with the, with the framework approach. And all, I, I think that some things that start off with the library approach have become a lot more frameworky, And this is a challenge. And now, conversely, I think things that start off as frameworks are trying to figure out a way to backpedal a little bit and become a little more like a library. Now, I think here at HashiConf, what we see is that library kind of idea. I, I love the kind of the, the, the hashy ethos from my perspective is that library ethos. Um, and I, I, you know, I love Vault is just over here. Here's what Vault does. It integrates with other things, but you know what it does. Then we've got Nomad. It's over here. Uh, it, that, I think, is, is very helpful because it allows you to adopt Vault without adopting Nomad or vice versa. That's very important. So we, when we see examples of that, I mean, one example of that is an orchestration. Um, when you've got this kind of framework approach to orchestration, you may have this kind of all-knowing framework that doesn't actually have the right fit for some applications. So one of the things that we saw is like, we actually really need to put the idea of orchestration, service discovery, 
into the application where it belongs, not have the all-knowing framework. We call this application-centric orchestration. Um, we dubbed it the autopilot pattern. You can kind of go to the website and check that out. Um, and the kind of the first embodiment of this is this thing called Container Pilot. It's all open source. And the nice thing with Container Pilot is, unlike a lot of the other stuff we've done, frankly, you can use Container Pilot and not use anything else that we've built. Um, yes, it works it, like Hashi, um, like HashiCorp. We, we've designed this to use totally on its own, and people are using it on its own, and which is great. Um, because we think it's really valuable. We're using it a lot um, because, again, you've got all this logic just lives in the application, in the container. Um, you can totally wrap your brain around it. It's a couple thousand lines ago. That's it. Um, it's, it, it. So we think it's pretty powerful. And we're looking for other abstractions like that. So that, uh, that's definitely kind of one angle that we need to kind of collectively take. Um, in terms of failure modes, so uh, one of the things that does drive me a little bit nuts is when people talk about containers, when you, and I, I, I try to remember how long I have known Adrian and how much I value my relationship with him, but sometimes Adrian is like, oh, problems are just fixed by dwarves, or they're fixed by magical pixies that live in the mines, and it's like, no, Adrian, failures are actually important, and just because you're not the one wearing a pager doesn't mean that they're not important. Failures do happen. Do people know what this is, by the way? This is the, the, the Northeast blackout. Um, in, in the 60s. So uh, the Great Northeast Blackout, is, this is much more the kind of failure mode that we need to worry about today. So no, it's not the same failure mode as we had in the past, but now it's a systemic failure mode. The entire system can potentially fail. And indeed, I actually think the, 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 the most apt metaphor for container failure, for this kind of microservice failure, is actually this one. Do people recognize this? This is Three Mile Island. Uh, and Three Mile Island this is one of the rare photos taken inside the control room during the crisis in Three Mile Island. And Three Mile Island, man, the more you know about Three Mile Island, the more you're like, this is what I deal with every day. I'm in Three Mile Island every single day. Why? Very complicated system. So here's their microservice architecture at Three Mile Island. <laughs> um, and so just to give you some, uh, a quick education in terms of the actual failure here, um, so they were running auto vacuum on Postgres. Uh, excuse me. They were, uh, they, they were cleaning out the, 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 the demineralizer over here. So they're, they're, trying, they're, they're, they're flushing the resins out of the demineralizer. They put basically too much pressure down there. Some water popped into an airline, and that condenser pump went offline. It stopped. It's fine. This is supposed to happen. But the auxiliary pumps, which are not in this diagram, actually did not fire, which is not fine. That's not supposed to happen. It's one of the major failures here. That didn't happen. Fortunately, there's a third system. That number seven up there is called the pilot operated relief valve. That detected what was now overpressure in the reactor, right? So we actually have, we are not cooling the reactor fast enough, and that thing pops open, OK? So, so far, so roughly good. It's, it, this, we had, the failure of the auxiliary pumps is very bad. But here's where you get to the, the most apt metaphor for the failures we deal with. Because the, there was an, when the pressure finally dropped, the pilot operated relief valve automatically closes. But there was an error in the actual light on the control in that it was, it, it was simply misdesigned. The light will go off when power has been applied to the solenoid to close it, not when it's actually closed. So every operator is trained to, like, if you feel that the reactor is, is actually losing coolant, make sure that the pilot-operated relief valve is closed. But from the panel, it is. It's not lit. You cannot blame these guys, and indeed the final findings of this didn't, for not knowing that this thing was actually that broken in its design. And this is what we deal with all the time. Right, where you've got a monitoring where your monitoring is actually screwed up, or your monitoring is causing the problem, or your monitoring is not seeing the problem. Right? Monitoring is great, monitoring is important, but the problem is when we replace our basic understandings of the system with lights, we, we end up in this situational unawareness that leads to a meltdown. And we, it happened, it, uh, obviously this is, you know, we're talking about a much more serious issue with a nuclear reactor, but as more and more of the world is on software, as more and more mainstream commerce is on software, this is gonna become more and more important, and preventing failures of this nature is gonna be very important. So when we talk about containers, we talk about microservices, everyone's like, yay, in production, yay, we love production. It's like, okay, stop, stop. This whole like romanticization of production. Production is war, as the people in this room know. And war is hell. So if you're talking about, like, I can't wait to be in production, it's like, I can't wait to go to Afghanistan. Yay! It's like, no, like where's your Kalashnikov? Please. Like, you're not going backpacking, OK? This is a war zone. And production is a war zone, especially a distributed system, microservice-based distributed system. Because these things can fail in really, really, really nasty ways. Yes, they can survive certain classes of failure. 
but don't look at their ability to survive failure. Look at the kind of pathologies that they have with cascading timeouts, uh, hard to reproduce problems, and so on. We need to begin to think not in terms of the program, but the system. So this is a very real problem, and it's going to be a challenge for all of us going forward. Another challenge, the Jevons paradox. So uh, Jevons was a, I believe, a Scottish economist, made a very interesting observation uh, in the 19th century, and that is as coal burning became more efficient, coal use went up. It's like, hmm? Because people could now do more. There are more things they could go do. We are seeing the exact same thing with containers, absolutely. Because containers allow you to do more and be more efficient, people are doing more. And we've talked to plenty of customers. It's like, I, this is more efficient, right? Yes. Why is my AWS bill higher? It's like, ah, that. Because it's very easy to kind of spin up all of this stuff. And, and, I, and either forget it, or you're using it for a new use that you had before. So we are absolutely going to see this. And the idea that we currently have now of scheduling containers in VMs, scheduling your container on this sucker, bad idea. It cannot possibly survive into the long term, especially as we're going to use computers to do more. That we, 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 this is going to be explosive in terms of cost if we are doing as we are doing today, which is putting containers inside of VMs. How do I know this will be exciting? And, and Kelsey gave a great talk this morning where he's playing Tetris. And you're like, no problem. Like, we'll just play Tetris. It's like, yeah, about Tetris. So some of these things are like, you know when you lose Tetris, like Kelsey did out with the Oracle. I love the Oracle example where you kind of lost Tetris. That we, you will lose Tetris because you end up with islands that have been provisioned, VMs that have one and two containers on them that you actually can't spin down. Is it, this is the challenge. So we, and from our perspective, VMs just don't belong here. We need to get rid of the floppy disk, please. We need to go to container native infrastructure where containers are running directly on the metal. That's the only way we can achieve and unlock the tenancy that is the promise of this incredible revolution. And we believe, by the way, that you know, a lot of people think on-prem computing is dead. The death of on-prem computing has been greatly exaggerated. Lots and lots of people have on, on-prem computing doesn't necessarily mean blades and sands. And if you're like, what's a blade or a sand? Like, oh, God bless you. Let, let me preserve your innocence, please. Um, <laughs> that is so great. Um, I, I love that. And I'm not going to tell you about this filth that is these legacy enterprise architectures. But that is not what on-prem computing has to mean. The decision between on-prem and public cloud should be based on economics. It should be rent versus buy. If you've got enough compute, you're going to want to buy your own computer, as it turns out. Uh, it's risk management. Uh, what happens if I, in terms of, of security and, and, and compliance, what happens if someone gets into this data? And then that admittedly has been, I, that's, to a certain degree, that, that is less of a concern. I mean, certainly, like, the public cloud is safe. But if your entire business is your data, that, that you're probably not going to trust it to anybody. Um, and then latency. The speed of light is a constant. That's not changing. Uh, economics dominates. The reason that private cloud efforts have all failed to date is because they don't realize the underlying economics. They're trying to preserve these fat margins from the blade and sand era going into private cloud. We think that we can't do that. We need to on-prem computing should just be another AZ. That's it. If it's anything more than another AZ, the effort itself has failed. So I think we're going to see that for sure going forward. So that brings us to hashtag serverless. OK. <laughs> now, now, fortunately, I, um, I'm going to try not to have an aneurysm on this one, because right, this is clearly a meaningless term, obviously. It's like hashtag serverless is like hashtag CPU list or hashtag instruction list. Like, I don't execute instructions. It's like, all right, that's great. Like, you're not running software. I'm sorry. I guess I, you're welcome to not execute instructions, but you're not software. Um, so it's like, OK, it's clearly meaningless. But then I try to get to control my rage. I'm like, OK. But on the other hand, there is something real being expressed here, which is the idea to kind of get off of this low level of abstraction, the server, and get to a higher level of abstraction, to think in terms of the function that you're providing. And we think this is great. Look at Manta. We love Manta. We love thinking about this. But the virtual machine is a vestigial abstraction. We cannot get to hashtag serverless without getting rid of the VM. It's ridiculous to think, I'm not running on a server. Well, now you're running on a server. You're running on two of them that don't even know about each other. You're running on a virtual floppy disk. How about hashtag floppy list? Let's try that one first. Um, so I said, don't say hashtag serverless when please, what you actually mean is hashtag VMless. Please, please, please. And with that, thank you very much.